Boulder prepared for this terrible moment for a stream of its citizens all needing emotional support and healing. He was taken from them not long after one of the most beautiful moments of their lives. A daughter's love for a man born to be a dad. It's really hard to see the person we know so well, his name up there. But it means so much that the whole community is really coming together. Your beautiful generosity is building the foundation to support families today and the community tomorrow. It's what you do when Colorado needs help. This is next. Grief and trauma can creep up on you. One minute you're fine, the next not so fine. It does not matter if you were there in Boulder, if you knew those involved, or whether it's some hurt surfacing from a past mass shooting in Colorado or something else in your life. Help's available right now in Boulder. It is one stop at a family assistance center for counselors, for victims advocates. There are therapy dogs there. Anusha Roy shows us how that county very specifically prepared, hoping that they would never need this. Within three and a half hours of the first officers being dispatched Monday, Boulder's Office of Emergency Management, along with community resources, set up. The impact for, from this is community-wide. And under one roof, brought in crisis counseling, the Salvation Army, Red Cross, victims advocates, therapy dogs. It's a place where people can come to talk. And the resources are still set up at the VIA Mobility site, ready for anyone who needs them. A lot of folks who, um, had lost loved ones. We've seen some folks that were employees, um, not only of the grocery store, but also of the surrounding businesses that were impacted by this. And, and then others who, um, who witnessed some things that are coming to get some behavioral health support. The Family Assistance Center was set up by 6 p.m. Monday because Boulder had a plan if the unthinkable happened, hoping they would never use it. I was on the phone to that person. When are you arriving? What are we doing? Jocelyn Fankhauser said the infrastructure was being built and researched over the years as a part of the county's planning, but wasn't fully flushed out yet. Some of the details weren't all written down. But the relationships were in place, a site picked out so that people showed up right away, and community members have been helping fellow community members. I heard a lot of people talking about, you know, knowing uh, a person who was there, knowing a coworker that was there. And talking to Jocelyn, she was saying that, you know, there has been at least some comfort in knowing that they are helping other people through this process. And they want everyone to know that this is open to anyone who wants to come in, connect with resources, just talk to someone. This is the Family Assistance Center. It's open from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. It's going to be open through Sunday, possibly extending the hour. So that's something we'll keep an eye on to update you guys. And again, this is at 2855 North 60. 63rd Street and Kyle open, as they said, to anyone who just needs to connect right now. I imagine, Nusha, they also have a, a plan for once that center ends up closing. Yeah, they want people to actually go to the Boulder Office of Emergency Management website, and they said there they'll be able to connect you to longer term resources. And also, you can just go in the next couple of days and check in with the folks there and figure out what those long term resources are going to be, just so you know what it is, you know, beyond this Sunday. And we'll talk in just a moment about how we as a broader community can support those long term resources mm -hmm. together. Thank you so much, Anusha. Officer Eric Talley's funeral is going to be live streamed next Tuesday. And we learned today that his handcuffs took his accused killer to jail. The father of seven was the first officer to respond to the King Super shooting on Monday afternoon. He went directly inside right after the shooter and was killed. Boulder police said today that Talley's fellow officers used his handcuffs when they transported the suspected shooter from the hospital to the jail. One by one. We are learning about the 10 Coloradans lost. Kevin Mahoney had the kind of kindness that made him adored not just by his kids, but by a neighborhood full of them who saw him as a second dad. Last year, his daughter Erica convinced him that she did not need a big, elaborate wedding delayed due to the pandemic. All she needed was him by her side, walking her down the aisle in her backyard. He preferred the outdoors anyway. I spoke with Kevin's daughter, Erica, and his wife, Ellen, at their home in Boulder. 
He was a son, a husband, a father, a friend, and his life matters as all of our lives matter. I feel like my dad was such a wonderful man that the world should know who he was because he just represented love and light. And there's such a ripple effect from this that One death is so many more people hurt. You shared the photo that I think a lot of people have seen of you and your dad at your wedding, uh, of him walking down the aisle. Um, every dad dreams of having a kid that looks at him like that. Yeah. Um, when you see that photo, what do you see? I really see my dad because he is such a softy and you can tell that he's so proud and he's holding back tears. That moment is so vivid and I can never, I will never forget it. I just admire my dad so much. Your dad was very excited to become a grandfather. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was. What will your daughter know about him? That he loves her so much and you know on some level they'll be together but that he just was the kindest, most amazing man. He loved the environment. He loved national parks. And I think she's gonna be like spunky like him. She'll be outdoorsy. Yeah, she'll be outdoorsy for sure. <laughs> we hiked a lot together all around here, which is why we love it here. He hated people who littered. I have just have to throw that out because that was something that really bothered, bothered him. Like probably many marriages after 35 years, it wasn't seamless. It was, we had our, our struggles. What happened with the pandemic, for us, it actually brought us closer together and reminded me more of the beginning of our marriage. It was a renewal for you guys. Yes, it was. I really am grateful for that year together. Every single day we have an opportunity to choose kindness and love over violence and hate. And my dad represented love and kindness. I asked the Mahoney's for one small thing that each of us could do to celebrate Kevin's life. His daughter suggested that we each go on a hike and connect with nature. And his wife said we should pick up some of that litter along the way. The accused shooter went before a judge for the first time this morning, now becomes a two or three month wait while his public defenders, quote unquote, access his mental illness. He provided no evidence of mental illness in court today, as expected. Our Marshal Zellinger spoke with attorneys about the next steps and how they will defend the seemingly indefensible. The case against the accused grocery store shooter slowed immediately as his state appointed attorneys review whether or not he understands what's happening. It'd be impossible to hold someone accountable if they're mentally incapable and wholly unaware of what is being done. Defense attorney Andrew Ho is a former Colorado State Public Defender who understands the next steps. Asking for a mental health evaluation at the start of the case is not about what happened on Monday. Primarily, they're gonna be asking questions such as, do you know who the judge is? What is the role of a judge? Do you know what criminal proceedings look like? This delay is not to determine whether or not he, he had mental capacity at the time of the event. Rather, in order to determine the competency of an individual, it's today. As of today, what is your mental health like? Take, for instance, the accused Colorado Springs Planned Parenthood shooter. His 2015 case really has not progressed past the stage we're at today in Boulder because he's been deemed incompetent to understand the trial. There have been times where I have talked to a client initially and felt that they were completely competent, only later to realize from their actions or words that I, I overspoke and that I needed to have them looked at. You know Scott Robinson from watching Nine News. He's a defense attorney who sometimes has to defend his role in a case. The most common question asked of defense attorneys is, how can you represent someone you know to be guilty? And the answer is, to the best of your ability, using legitimate defenses, and providing only truthful testimony. Asked another way, defense attorneys sometimes hear, 
How do you sleep at night? It becomes difficult to sleep at night if you are willing to sacrifice our constitutional principles for certain individuals just because of what they're accused of. We're used to seeing defendants in court for the first time, then a few days later, an entry of plea, and then a preliminary hearing where we see a sample of the evidence that justify the charges. What happened today slows it down to make sure that the defendant here understands the process. If he doesn't, the trial waits until he's mentally capable, like we see in the Planned Parenthood case. If he's found competent, then he could be evaluated to determine his mental state the day of the crime, and that's where a possible not guilty by reason of insanity plea comes into play, similar to the Aurora Theater case, Kyle. Marshall, I imagine the public defenders have a lot of access to the defendant to assess his mental state. What can prosecutors be doing now to investigate his mental state? I, I spoke with some former prosecutors from the Aurora Theater case. Some of the things that were mentioned were have a camera on him in jail over the next few weeks and months and find out does, does he eat his meals does he throw it at the wall does he request books to read by title and do they seem you know quote unquote normal are his behaviors when he is in custody what you would want to show a jury to prove they're saying one thing but look at this video along the way and it might say something else Appreciate it. That was real insight on how this part of the judicial process works. Thank you, Marshall. We're used to hearing students say the rules should be loosened. There's a group of students that say the rules need to be changed to better protect them. Are the adults listening? That's next. Some sunshine today, a nice break between storms, but we have one more storm that will move across Colorado tonight before we get to the much advertised warming and drying trend for the weekend. Scattered snow showers in the high country tonight, rain and snow moving into the metro area tonight and tomorrow. It'll be a cooler day tomorrow, but it's not an overly cold storm and we're not going to see much of any accumulation. As a matter of fact, for some of you, this storm will bring rain, all rain and no snow at all. Tonight, partly cloudy, low 30 overnight rain and snow showers continue off and on on Friday with a chillier high at 47. We get you into a good looking weekend. Sunshine and 51 Saturday, mid 60s Sunday, close to 70 Monday. Next chance for rain and snow next storm Tuesday of next week. More than a cup. Co co Let's slow down and try that again. More than a quarter of all Coloradans are at least partially vaccinated for COVID-19. Just past 900,000 people who have completed the vaccination process. 557,000 people are waiting on their second dose. Just when it seemed like our hospitalization numbers were headed back down, we see another single day jump. Now 311 patients in Colorado's hospitals, up from 304 yesterday, so it appears we're still in that plateau. Our positivity rate yesterday was 3.2%. Our weekly average for tests coming back positive for COVID is hovering just over 4%. That's acceptable in the eyes of public health experts, and acceptable is the new excellent. Our biggest concern was just the lack of accessibility of our Title IX policy to students who are younger and also students who speak other languages as well. They're the rules that protect students from sexual assault and harassment. And the students have some fresh ideas on how this needs to work. Let's listen next. School district policy tends to be a fat stack of rules on how students should behave and what the administrators will do if they don't. A group of teenagers at Denver East High School say the existing system has failed them, especially when it comes to sexual assault and harassment. So the students are going to try and fix it. Here's Aaron Nelson Garcia. Amongst the tradition and history of Denver East High School is a question posed by students like Lilia Scudamore. It's a very long way down the road. She is a senior at East and wants to know if Denver Public Schools is doing enough to change this. Last September, students protested what they call a rape culture after another allegation of sexual assault. Show me what community looks like. After years of issues surrounding accusations of assault, harassment, and school faculty reporting it. We realized that there was a lot of miscommunication and lack of information really from the district about what the Title IX process really is. 
Denver Public Schools, like every school district, must develop policy based on a federal statute known as Title IX. Title IX is a federal law that prevents discrimination on the basis of sex in all schools that receive school funding. Scudamore is part of a group trying to get DPS to fix its procedures. So teens across Denver feel like they have a voice. Really our biggest concern was just the lack of accessibility of our Title IX policy to students who are younger and also students who speak other languages. Scudamore says the district policy doesn't adequately address when a student threat should be removed from campus. That entire section is not even in DPS's policies. Thank you for your advocacy. Thank you for fighting for a better process. Thank you for making sure our process is right for you. Michelle Berge is the general counsel for DPS. She says the district is making changes. The most important thing we can do are the remedies right? Because we need to assure that students are safe and protected uh, and they feel safe and protected. Really for these conversations to happen from an elementary school level. So when students are more likely to face them in middle school and high school, they know how to act. They know that they'll have resources available to them. Teaching students the meaning of no and harassment can start early, according to the district's director of student equity and opportunity, Ellen Kelty. Helping students understand their rights and understanding consent and understanding how to keep themselves safe starts in preschool. To learn about consent and the mandatory reporting process. Kelty's team created this video last fall for students around DPS. Our students, particularly our girls, are finding their voice and they're finding their voice around consent. <laughs> A voice that wants to change the culture at East. A voice that Scudamore believes begins with a question and a demand for answers. I would love to continue this work, but I do believe it's up to other students as well to continue doing it. For next, I'm Nelson Garcia. And it will be up to them. Scudamore's graduating senior says she hopes the younger students pick up the cause when she goes to college. We are not powerless to help our neighbors in Boulder right now because you are doing something, $5 at a time, to immediately support the victims' families and build a long-term fund for when public attention moves elsewhere. I have an update on your incredible generosity next. Together, you continue to be a force for good in our community in the worst times. Since Tuesday night, next viewers have raised $200,000 for the Boulder County Crisis Fund. It's a nonprofit fund that's first going to focus on the immediate needs of the victims' families, and then they'll turn to the long-term healing and support of the Boulder community for years and years to come. I'd be grateful if you would consider joining this week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign, because together you're making a significant difference in starting this fund. You text the word thanks to 303-871-1491. I'll send you that link to donate. You can find the same link anywhere that you find next online. $200,000 raised by you so far. Community Foundation Boulder County is a nonprofit that has been there doing the work for decades. They are going to be there for the long term, which is when we know the attention is inevitably, inevitably going to fade, but the need for support will remain. So thank you for what you're doing. Susan Palmer writes in tonight to say, Thanks for once again giving us a chance to do a little something for others. She says, I probably never would have discovered this charity. I hope it helps them as much as it has helped me. Susan's discovered the secret. See you next time.